Hello physics fans and welcome to our next lecture on electromagnetism. We left off when we, we established that electric and magnetic fields are equal. They are inducing each other over and over again. So now we've established that those fields are basic properties of light. Let's talk about more properties of light, specifically energy in terms of light. So one thing we're going to establish is that energy can be stored in fields, both electric and magnetic. Right. So think about this. If I've got my proton, it's radiating electric fields all sorts of directions. You might recall from Coulomb's law that that electric field goes as 4 pi epsilon naught. 1 over all that charge over the distance from the charge squared, all pointing out radially. So there's a little conundrum that we have to figure out, right? We'd say how much energy is stored in there. How much energy is stored in there? But look back at the R squared dependence. The electric field exists everywhere. All right? Fields are not local quantities. They exist everywhere in space. So we need to shift our mindset, all right? We have to ask how much energy is in a given volume. How much energy is stored in a volume of space? And that's what we're going to call our energy density. So let's put this in perspective a little bit. All right, what, what do I mean by energy density? Let's go to our classic, our favorite. Right. We'll go to our favorite object, the parallel plate capacitor. And that's creating electric fields from the positive and negative plates. And now we just say, all right, give me some finite volume, whatever that may be. And you say, okay, how much electric fields? We've already asked questions of like how much they're flexing through it. Now we're saying how much energy is present there. And for the electric field, we'll find, let's see here. Let's go with that energy density, okay? Energy density. If U is the energy density, this is a lowercase u, that's going to be the energy per unit volume. Energy volume. And for our electric fields, this turns out to be just one half the electric permittivity constant E squared. All right? Should look familiar. Think back to the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is just one half NV squared. Remember how you have a quantity something squared? Constant quantity squared. Constant quantity squared. look familiar to you and this is a recurring theme in physics that you see one half constant quantity squared in energy terms so that's our electric field energy density 
But what about the magnetic field? Well, let's get a picture of that. Classic example, let's make this a 3D object. Our example will be we'll have some current I going around this way. And we'll have our box of volume. Arbitrary for now. And this is creating magnetic fields that do something like this. My energy stored in this box now. The energy density magnetic field is going to be a 1 over 2, 1 over the magnetic permeability constant, still constant, magnetic field strength squared. Now let's combine these, right? Light is E and V fields. So the energy density of light is the sum of the two. It'll be UE plus UV, but we got some tricks that we can do. This is one half electric permeability constant, E squared, one half, one over the magnetic permeability constant, V squared. Now recall for fields, specifically electromagnetic waves, E is just equal to C B. Must be true if it's a electromagnetic wave. So we're gonna rewrite this. We're going to leave the first term alone. We'll leave this guy alone. And we're going to express the B in terms of E's. This is a just convention that everyone has settled on. We'd like to refer to make uh, measurements with respect to the electric field. Could do it in magnetic field. It's completely arbitrary choice. It's just convention. We've settled on the electric field. So I'm going to rewrite the second term. We'll have 1 over U naught. And now this will be E over C squared. Furthermore, again recall that the speed of light came from these epsilon naught mu naught constants. So I'm going to rewrite C. This will be, leave that first term alone, 1 over mu naught. All right, so we're going to have a 1 over 1 over epsilon naught mu naught e squared. Squaring the c canceled the square root in the definition. All right, now let's simplify. Mu naught cancel out. One over one over e naught is equal to e naught. And boom, we get that the light energy density is just e naught e squared. And I have to do civic where E is some function, right? Function of time and position. This will matter for us very shortly. So I'm going to say shine a ray of light give myself some weird volume of space and say, how much energy is in that volume? Well, for anyone who soaks up rays, ever gotten a sunburn or a suntan, you don't really think about this volume of space around you. You think more about, well, how many rays are hitting me right now? Should I hide in the shade? Should I put on sunblock? You're thinking about that energy spread out over an area not that volume. So we want to quantify that. And that's going to be called our intensity. All 
right? So we can say that light transfers energy. We know how much energy it transfers. It's just the energy per volume. So we know how much it transfers energy, but let's quantify this further. Let's quantify this as something that's easier to measure and relate to. So we're gonna go back to our abstract and then work our way down. We'll have this picture again, where the electric field is doing some sinusoidal motion. The wave itself is propagating at the speed of light. Recall the magnetic field will be perpendicular to this. Now, this is obtuse. We're trying to think of this sinusoidal wave as it propagates down. Well. Let's just focus on the peaks. We'll focus on just the peaks. And we're going to come up with what we call our plane waves. So let's say, look, at a peak, there's a peak, there's a peak, there's a peak, peak. Just associate a nice plane propagating, propagating down. So this is peak E fields. And each one of these is propagating at the speed of light moving down this direction. All right. So we have some area with these little plane waves as they propagate. And remember, the plane wave just represents peak electric field, peak electric field, peak electric field. So to find the energy, we need some volume. We've got some area. Sweep it out. So Find the volume swept out by the plane waves. One second, come on. There we go. So I'll only draw two to simplify the picture. We'll have just two peaks. We've got some area A. And we know that it's swept out some air, some distance. So now we've created a little box. The distance here, that distance is going to be speed of light, the velocity, times some little time distance. We say that a little bit of time has transpired from when the peak was here at the first one to the next one. Now we can say, well, how much energy is stored in here, right? How much energy is stored in that box? Well, we can say, look, there's some delta, capital U, so total energy is equal to the energy density times the volume. All right, as a reminder, volume, All right? Well, we know what the energy density of light is, so delta U is equal to epsilon naught E squared, the volume, whatever that area is times the speed of light, how much time has transpired to sweep out that volume. So let's start moving, let's start moving terms to the side. I'm going to divide out by A and delta T. So I now have 
1 over A, the change in energy over the change in time is equal to epsilon naught C E squared. All right, analysis time. Delta U over delta T, that's power. That's the rate of energy transfer. How quickly does that light move energy? So I can now write this as 1 over A, the power is equal to epsilon naught C electric field squared. And now we're going to get to new definitions. There's going to be two coming up. First one's going to be the pointing vector. This is an important step, but what's going to matter for us in our future analysis is what comes after the pointing vector, which will be our intensity. And they're intimately related to each other. So for the purposes of this course, think of the pointing vector as just a step to our next quantity that we want to calculate. It is a very important vector. Any physicists or engineers out there, the pointing vector is a very important quantity. But for this course, we're going from pointing vector to the very intimately related intensity. So definition. the pointing vector. And no, that's not a misprint. It's named after the person who quantified this. It is a capital S and it's defined as the power per unit area. All right. So the pointing vector S is going to be epsilon naught C E squared. The units of this thing is going to be a watt per meter squared. And it has a vector associated with it. Think back to our favorite sinusoidal waves. There's the electric field, magnetic field, and we said it's propagating at some speed c. Well, C points in the S direction. So the pointing vector points in the direction that that energy is transferring. So that specifies the direction of energy transfer. Right, but recall if E is some function of time and position, then S is time dependent. Well, you're standing outside, you're basking in the glorious sunlight, and all you care about is just how much energy has come to you on average, not all the different individual wiggles. So what we measure the average of S. So definition. The intensity is the average of S. Average of the pointing vector. So I, by definition, is just this average of the pointing vector. Not too important for our purposes. Be a bit more explicit. It's the average of this relationship. E, it's some sinusoidal function. So E is something like a sine of time. Something like that. So plot this out. Here. 
here's time, here's E. What's it doing? Well, it's going to positive one, negative one, positive one, negative one, so on. Well, let's look at E squared now. E squared. Well, that's going to go to positive one, to positive one, to positive one, positive one. Positive one minus one, positive one, one half. So the average of the pointing vector, the intensity, this is the equation that we're going to care about. It turns out to be just one half again, E naught C, the maximum guilt strength squared. And this one's so important, it gets a nice pretty box. So what have we established? We established that this intensity is this average of the energy spreading out. Recall, I will have the same units of S, so it's gonna have units of watts per meter squared. So intensity depends on how powerful the ray is And area, the area that that light sp spread out over. So put this perspective, how many of you ever had a flashlight in the darkness? You shine the flashlights and you illuminate the room and that light doesn't hurt. But then some of you want to tell your scary story. So what do you do? You bring the flashlight underneath your face and you blind yourself, right? Same battery, same light source. So here's my flashlight. And it's gonna be shining rays of light out. Let's look at how much area it covers. If I'm really close to it, if I'm really close, I'm getting a ton of rays into me. So it's this huge intensity. There's a lot of energy per unit area. But if I spread out, if I spread out, the number of rays intersecting me aren't as much. The intensity has gone down. So here we have high intensity and low intensity. Think about that light spread out over a area. That's what's happening. So before we do some problems with this intensity, we need to talk about the polarization state. And from there, we'll develop a law called Malice's Law, and then we'll start doing some calculations, because we're all quants in this class. We want to calculate stuff. So, a bit more theory we gotta develop. We need to talk about the polarization. Ray polarizations. What does that mean, all right? So, general, waves have a polarization direction. I hope you're good at drawing 3D pictures because we're about to draw several of them. So, 
the first one, we'll always go back to our classic example. I have my electric field doing some sinusoidal oscillation. Specific, this is X, here's Y, and there's Z. Now, focus on nodes here, all right? I'm gonna say, what's the orientation? Well, the orientation is this way, this way, this way, this way. So if I redraw this picture, I'm gonna shrink it down a little bit. I see a polarization that direction. So I'd say this is linearly polarized, in silly eye in the y direction well there's no reason that it has to be in the y direction all you gotta do is rotate the light so we could instead have a different wave we could have one that is oriented along the z axis i could have waves Y, Z, and now I have linearly polarized in the Z direction. And one more of these linear examples, X, Y, Z. It could be some combination. It could be at an angle. So now this one is linear polarization in the, oop, not X, that's traveling down the X. This is linear polarized in the Y, Z direction. Whew. So what we're doing is talking about how's the wave what does the wave look like as it's oscillating? Is it doing like this? Is it this? Is it some combination of the two? Is it another category? There's a lot of different polarization states. This will be the last one we draw. We could have a circular We have a circular polarization. X, Y, Z. And what does a circular one do? Well, it loops around. It'll go, choop. it'll be rotating as it propagates down the X direction. So this wave is not only doing this kind of motion, it's doing something like this. Oops. It's rotating around as it propagates along. So, tricks we can do. Stuff we can do with this polarization now that we know about it. Well, gotta go back to black ink. We can control the polarization. We can introduce polarizing filters to change the polarization state. Let's go back to this circular polarized guy, All right? What I'm gonna do is send my wave down but I'm gonna have a little linear polarizer here. Let's redraw this. There we go. And fill this guy in. All right, so I'm gonna call this a linear polarizer. Now, 
Now, there are all sorts of different types of polarizers. All I'm trying to do is get the schematic picture in your head. So, we're going to send in our circularly polarized light. And only the light that is aligned along with the polarizer is allowed through. Anything in this direction gets blocked off. So in the end, only the light doing that is allowed. So you start off with circular light and you end up with linear polarization states. Now that we say this, right? So only the part of wave aligned with the filter can pass through. So Two important things about these polarized filters. All right, day one, they change the polarization state. We do that, we did that at the figure. They change the polarization state. Of the incident wave. Number two, they must reduce the intensity they must do both so let's now start tying our ideas together we established there's this intensity the amount the rate of energy transfer per area now we have this polarization filter of this light's doing all this crazy motion and then it crosses some filter and now we've lobbed off what it can do so let's think about it this way you've got incident light say light from the sun which is just tons and tons of photons stacked on top of each other we'd call that unpolarized lights Here's my incident ray. Need a little more space? I'm gonna have some light here. And it has no preferred polarization. It'll be some intensity I naught. And this is our unpolarized light. Well, it's propagating down this direction. And now let's introduce a polarized filter. Right. There's our filter. So our polarized light will propagate down and then only the light aligned with that line will pass through. So only some I1 gets through. Well, then we can have a, another polarizing filter. This one could be a different angle. Let's have it go this way. All right. angle phi. Now this ray is not completely orthogonal to that so some of it gets through and there's some final intensity. So as we cross through the filters the intensity of light getting through keeps getting lower and lower. So what's a good use of this? What's a good use of this? Well, anyone ever heard of polarized sunglasses? Perfect example of this, right? 
you've got blinding sunlight. All right? Sunlight's got a huge intensity. And then you take your glasses. I'm going to have very stylish glasses. And that intensity is just immediately cut down, right? In fact, it cuts the intensity by half. Just having polarized glasses filled hitting that unpolarized light just cuts that intensity down dramatically, significantly better than your unpolarized glasses. If you ever want to know if you have polarized or unpolarized glasses, put two of them together and change the angle relative between them. Because we're going to show tricks of how we can completely cut all light passing through polarized filters. So let's see this in action, all right? Quants now, we finally get to do some problem solving. We're gonna introduce what's called Malice's Law. Shorten this, Malice's Law. What does this do? It gives the intensity of light. After passing through polarized filters. So the equation itself, the transmit intensity is equal to the incident intensity times a cosine square phi with a caveat. If the incident intensity is unpolarized, then that transmit intensity has to be half. Think of the sunglasses example. So there's Malice's Law. Come on. One gets a red box. It's that important for us. Oh, go back. There we go. So let's let's do some problems. All right, so let's work out a problem together of actually figuring out what the heck all this means. So here's my problem. Start with unpolarized light. it'll have some initial intensity of I naught equals 10 watts per meter squared. It's first pass through, right? right. So pass that through two polarizers that are orthogonal. They make 90 degrees with respect to each other. Two orthogonal polarizers. What's the transmit intensity, All right? in this first case. So, I always like to be a picture guy. I always want my picture, so start with my 
unpolarized light I not. It's then going to hit a polarizer and I'm just going to assign a direction. All right. So this gets through. We'll call this I1. Because it was initially unpolarized, we know this has to be half of I0. Or in our case, it's five watts per meter squared. Light's traveling that way. Now let's add our next guy. This one's polarized this way. So there's this cosine phi in Malance's law. What is it? Well, it's the angle between polarization states. So there's phi. So I final, I'll call it I2 for now. I2 equals question mark, question mark. So we've already figured out what I1 is, so we'll skip that for now. And we'll say what I2 is, we'll apply Malice's law. I2 is equal to whatever the incident ray is, I1, times cosine squared phi. Well, cosine squared phi, this is I1 times cosine squared of 90 degrees. Well, if you remember your sine cosine rules, you'll remember that cosine of 90 is zero, null. So this just ends up being zero watts per meter squared. There is no transmitted ray. No transmitted light, the polarizers completely block it. All right, let's try this again. Let's introduce a third polarizer. Between the orthogonal ones. Between the original two. So, let's go through this again. We're gonna have ray traveling in that direction. It starts off as unpolarized light. It'll hit one polarizer. Then we're gonna hit our next guy. We'll introduce this new polarizer. I'll specify at 60 degrees. So this guy here, 60 degrees, it's going to be about that. Let me shrink down my font a little bit. 60 degrees there. And then keep going to our last guy. Now I ask, what is the transmitted intensity? I'll even make this one multiple choice. What do you guys think about this before you work out the math? Is it 5 watts per meter squared? We'll just go down in values. 3.33 watts per meter squared. 1 watt per meter squared. Or 0. Does all the light get blocked off? Alright. 
So while you're thinking of those answers, let's draw the pictures again. Always use the diagrams to guide us through these problems. So I'm basically going to recreate this, but add more information to it. So this is the question we're asking now, where I not still the 10 watts per meter squared. So let's go through this. Come on. Start off with my unpolarized lights. So there's I naught at 10 watts per meter squared. It'll hit that first polarizer. And some ray I1 that we know must be one half. That comes from Malice's law. Unpolarized hits a polarizer, half of it gets. Right? Or five watts per meter squared. Well, there, next guy. It'll hit this angle. Some of this ray is aligned with that. So we get some I2. Keep going. Keep going. Some of I2 lines up with that last guy. And I3 exists. So fact. Some light will get through. Whereas originally, none of it did. Somehow introducing a third blocking object now allows sunlight to be transmitted. So now let's work this out together. Let's work out all these steps. Come on. So, I1, I2, I3, let's calculate all these guys. We know what I1 is. We know I1 has to be 1 half I0 or 5 watts per meter squared, right? What is I2? Well, I2 is going to be the incident I1 times cosine squared phi. Well, we already told you. 60 degrees. So cosine squared of 60 degrees. Now, if you don't remember your right triangles, right. here's my 30, 60, 90. There's my 30, 60, 90 triangle. It has side lengths of square root 3, 1, Uh, hold on. This doesn't make sense. 60 degrees. That should be longer. Okay, we're good. We're good. All right. There's my right triangle. So, don't need no sneaking calculator. Here's I1 times the squared cosine of 60 degrees. Well, that's going to be 1 over 2 squared, which is just equal to Let's see here. One half I naught times one fourth or one eighth I naught. Let's keep going. Come on. Got to slide up. Program starting to slow down on me. Right, that's fine. There we go. So let's calculate that final transmitted intensity. Well, it's going to be I2 times cosine squared of an angle, but here phi is going to be. 30 degrees. Let me convince you of that. All right. So it starts off. All 
right? Oop, let's draw this a little bit bigger. All right? Here's my first guy. Here is 60 degrees. Last guy. It's now the angle of this guy relative to this guy. So, I know this is 60. That means this must be 30 degrees. All right. It's the angle of this ray relative to this new polarizer. And that's why the angle now shifts to 30 degrees. So, well, listen, this is I2 times cosine squared of 30 degrees. Do, 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 do. 30 degrees. Well, that's going to be square root 3 over 2. All right, so, oops, ahead of myself. 30 degrees. Let's see here. This is. Let's see here. I2 is equal to let's see. I2 is equal to one eighth I naught cosine thirty is square root three over two. That cosine is being squared. Now carry out the math. Carry things through. This is one eighth times. I'm not square root 3 over 2 squared becomes 3 over 4. Boy, it's big. 8 times 4. 8 times 4. That is 32 over 3. I'm not. Plug in values 3 over 32. I naught was 10 watts per meter squared. So this is now 30, 32 watts per meter squared. We can reduce that a little bit. This becomes 15, 16 watts per meter squared or 0 0.938. Per meter squared. The final transmitted intensity Ooh, make that word legible. So that final transmitted intensity is about one watt per meter squared, or 10% of that initial intensity. So there is a complex Malice's Law problem for you guys. So as we wrap up, I want to talk about some uses of polarizers, just so you have these things in your head. Some uses of polarizers, as we already established sunglasses very useful for sunglasses but they also come up in photography all right you can do special types of images how you record the images onto your plates all right you can use polarizers to help with that other uses you can have tons and tons of medical apps applications a common one is Death perception. You actually can put devices on people's faces, shoot different types of polarized light into their eyeballs, and measure the death perception, what their eyes' death perception is. Which brings me to a related 3D technology can't have 3D technology these days without using using uh, polarization. 
your glasses. If you've ever been to the big big movie theaters and seen a 3D movie, your glasses are actually called circular polarizers. I won't draw the circles because that's not actually accurate, right? Your 3D glasses Basically, one light rotating one way, the other lets the light in rotating the other way. And that combination, that combination creates the perception of death. You perceive death by seeing the light through the different circular polarized glasses. And then you just control. The filmmaker controls the level of depth by controlling the types of polarized light that they're bouncing into your eyes. So with that, we'll call it in here. Hope you're having a great time, and I'll see you all next time.